I'd like to preach to you the ongoing messages through the book of Hebrews as we preach through them in chapter 11, the third message out of the book of Hebrews, chapter 11 that is, is impossible without faith to please God or without faith it is impossible to please God. Let's just pause and ask God to rest our hearts for these minutes. Father, it has been good already to be here and we have been challenged in our selfishness and there at the end, Lord, challenged in the matter that you are good. And Father, how many different crises and problems are across our congregation this morning? Jobs, loss of spouses, problems, medical problems, financial problems, life direction. And yet you're good. And that encourages our hearts. And we hold to it like a rock in these times, Lord. And I pray that you would just be here and meet with us, Father. Do your great will as we pleaded for you to do. I ask, O oh God, that you would grant power in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Hebrews is like a law. Hebrews 11 is like a long, immense hallway. And if you can kind of turn it around, I can't do the hallway this way because I look this way. So if you can turn it around, this hallway is jaded in several spots with beautiful uh, paintings of people through the ages men and women on both sides of the hallway that go down the hallway they all have one theme that binds their lives together underneath the paintings is the blast uh, the brass placard lived by faith it is not someone who looked at them and who caused to say that or put that plaque up it was God in the pages of Hebrews chapter 11 who hangs these people up as being different than regular believers. At the beginning of this immense hallway, for the first three verses in Hebrews 11, there's an information desk, and it explains what it is to live by faith. It explains what faith is concerning a believer that has come to the Lord Jesus Christ and is now walking his life by faith in this God who Jesus brought who he, uh, Jesus, reached with one hand and grabbed the sinner and the other hand and grabbed God Almighty and joined these, reconciled them together, and now the Christian walks by faith. The first three verses are the information desk. And scattered throughout the paintings, in between, there are little verses or little hangings that explain more about the information desk of what it is for you and I to walk and to live by this thing called faith. We have reached Hebrews 11 through 10 chapters that argue one thing. Christ is better. He is the best thing and the only thing that can bridge the connection between regular folks like us who have sin in our life and a perfect God who will not accept sin. Now that's a great problem. And Jesus Christ is the bridge or the answer. The argument is over and over, chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, clear to chapter 10. You can try everything else, religion, you can try uh, donations to charity, you can try different schemes of religion, but in, in, at the end of it you'll find one thing, only Christ can bridge the gap. Only he is able to bring us to God with a right relationship because he can only deal with the sin issue, not religion. And for 10 chapters, as I have preached over the last months, he, we've argued this through the verses over and over and over. It is really Jesus Christ that deals with our sin catastrophe. It is only him that can make normal people be able to come to a perfect God. There is no other way. He is the bridge. He was the one that the Philippian jailer, a common man like you and I, found. As he, argued, uh, or as he argued with these two men that were thrown into the prison, probably had a part of, of beating them, Paul and Silas, and as they laid there talking about and singing and preaching and about this, this Jesus person of, of who it was rumored that he had risen from the dead after the Romans had crucified him and the Philippian jailer was sure of one thing, that he was dead. And as God allowed a, a, a physical earthquake to happen there, it was him that ran to these same men that he persecuted and fell down before them and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they came back with the same thing that I preached to you this morning at the beginning of this chapter. Before you can walk by faith, you must have faith in Jesus Christ. 
They said to him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. The Bible records that he was saved and his household was saved. And that same day, they publicized it by being baptized, confessing publicly that Jesus Christ was not only real, but he was the Son of God, and that his blood atones for sin, and they were going to put their faith and trust in him as their only hope for heaven. Now listen, you are the jailer here this morning as we begin. And you have got to come to a decision point in your life. Are you good or are you not good? And if you are good, are you good enough for a perfect God who will accept not even one sin to open his door of heaven to you? And if you conclude like the jailer, I am not good enough, I am a sinner before a holy God, and it is not a joke, I compare easily to others, but, it, but it's, it's impossible for me to com compare to God, I declare to you before we plunge into chapter 11 that you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. You must have him as your savior, your life boat however you want to say it you've got to have jesus and i i just cut away all the religion and i tell you he died for your sins on the cross he was beat and wounded because of every nasty thing you've ever done in your mind or your thoughts or in your actions he died for your selfishness he was wounded for your transgressions and bruised for your iniquities and the very point the beginning point of this message and i'll come to it at the end if you're not if you do not have jesus christ as your lord and savior and absolutely know it then don't wait for the end right now, there in the quietness of your own heart. Call out in prayer and ask Jesus Christ to save you. Admit your wickedness. You will not go to heaven. You do not have access to God. You do not walk with God, as we're about to say. And I encourage you, 10 chapters we have preached on that you must have Jesus Christ. In this chapter, chapter 11, there are three things that are noted through the lives of these people. Over and over and over, if you scan through chapter 11, you'll see people, these portraits through this long hallway, they all have something in common about faith. It's not just that they have faith, they have three points of that faith in common. You can see it however you diagram it. You can see, first of all, they believed in something God said. Now, through this whole, these, this, the, these whole illustrations, Abraham and, and Abel and, uh, and the women, and Rahab and all these people, they all were told something by God in different ways. Something was revealed to them by God. We get everything that we know right now from this Bible. Okay? That's God's word. But belief in your life, faith in your life of walking with God must be anchored upon something God has said. Some verse that you're making your job decision on some verse that you're choosing to move your family on, something that God has said, okay, is important. You must have something that God said. Belief is not based on some nebulous idea. I am in faith, look at me. No, it is based on something real, God's words. And then beyond that, there's the action. And I'm gonna knock this right off of here. If I don't move it, so I'm gonna move it. There is the action. Belief always demands reaction. If God says something, you gotta do something. You know that? There's a lot of people that say, I believe everything the word of God says, amen, that's right, but they never act on it. Belief always produces action in your life. That is rubber meets the road. You make decisions of every, dis every point in your life and how you act in your lifestyle based on what God says. Now that's faith when it, when it turns into action. Where there is no action, there is only dead faith. It's without works, James says, and it means nothing. It's not really faith. You don't really believe it. If you're not acting out what God has said in the verses of the Bible, you don't believe it. There's a last thing that, that connects all these people together, and that's reward. All of them were looking for God to reward them because they obeyed him. And that's not a bad thing, and it's not a covetous thing. It's just an expectation. Faith will, you know, you, we do this, we obey God because we really believe he's going to reward us, don't we? And that is the third element. So learn these three things as we go through these people. There's always belief. There's always an action from that belief. And there's always an expectation that God's going to reward. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 5 and 6, and we see another guy. Would you stand, stretch your legs, and learn about Enoch? The Bible says, by faith, Hebrews 11, verse 5, by faith, Enoch was translated that he, that's, that's the word transported. You know, it wasn't like he was speaking another language and somebody translated him, all right? By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony, that he pleased God, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Okay, so he pleased God. He had a certain faith. Now look at the end. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a, yell out the next word. He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. This verse is directly connected to this guy named Enoch. You may be seated. Here's the account of another faith-filled example named Enoch. 
There is something different here in the ver these two verses that we f than we find from any other person. You got to get this as, as a student of the word. This guy, these, this verse, verse number five, is different than all the other illustrations. You scan down all the other illustrations of these people of faith. There's something different in the grammar here. There's something different to what happens. He's different than Abel, than Noah, than Abraham. Clear down through the chapter. Notice it says in the verse number five that by faith he was translated. Okay? Now notice, that's not something he did. It's something that happened to him. That's different than everybody else. Everybody else in the chapter of 11 did something. But you notice here, this guy named Enoch was translated. Something happened to him. He was passive in it. It happened to him. In each of the other examples, Abel's Mo Abel, Moses, Abraham, all the others in this chapter, we see by faith the person did this or this. Okay? By faith, someone did this. By faith, Abel, for instance, in verse number four, offered. He did an action. Not so with Enoch. Enoch here, it's pointed out that something happened to him. By faith, he was translated. Something happened to him. In fact, we don't even see at all what he does until we look back at the Old Testament. We only see the reward that he was translated. He was transported. Old Testament rapture. I mean, he was just not. We'll get to that in a moment. I like that. Because of the reason, the Bible just says here that he pleased God, but we're not told, told how. See, verse 5 and verse 6 does not focus on the action that Enoch did, it focuses rather on what happened to him, or can we say it this way, the reward. The how is in the Genesis account that we'll look at in a moment. The emphasis on him, him pleasing God and the reward that came from that. And let me preach to you just to be in here this morning, that there is a reward to pleasing God. Amen. All right, it's not futility. And in, in the last, uh, in Audrey's uh, testimony, we hear these things, and some of you are going through all kinds of crises and all kinds of things, and you're holding to God, and you're trusting in God. Can I tell you, there is a reward. There is an end. Do you know what? I read this week the last chapter in the book of Job. Old Job was awaiting, and he was awaiting and awaiting and awaiting, and he was awaiting and awaiting and awaiting. But guess what? It finally came to an end. There is a reward to those who trust the Lord. You see the emphasis of this example, Enoch, is the reward of Enoch's faith. Let's read it one more time. Verse number five, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because the Lord translated him and it goes on. God wants to teach us that if we will handle our entire lives, now look at this, your decisions, your actions, your priorities, your worship, your marriage, your crisis, your child rearing, your pleasures, all of these things in faith, look, taking Bible verses acting on Bible verses, that reward will come. He will award us with the equivalent reward for our faith. Let me say it this way. Enoch's story teaches us that those that walk by with God by faith will receive full payment of their investment of faith. Let me say that again. Enoch's story teaches us that those that walk with God by faith and all the decisions of their life will receive the full payment of their investment of faith. There is not a believer in here that will walk by faith who will not be justly rewarded by God. And it may take many, many chapters for him to do that. And it may just be in heaven. However, God always rewards those that walk with him by faith. Now, let's be honest. Why would God transport this guy? Why would he translate Enoch directly to heaven to be with him? What action brought to that? Because there is an action by faith, even though this is specifically talking about reward. What action on Enoch's side prompted this? I want you to keep your finger here. We're going to be there, be here back here at the end. And turn to Genesis chapter 5 and verse number 22. Genesis 5 and verse number 22. Let's see what this original account looked like in Genesis chapter 5. Very early in the Bible, you'll notice. I mean, this guy was early on in the scriptures. Genesis 5 and verse number 22. Notice what it says. I'm going to begin verse number 21. Look at this. And Enoch lived 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah. You know Methuselah. He's the oldest man in all the Bible. But this was his daddy. And Enoch lived, lived uh, verse number 21 again, lived 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after... He begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. Look up here. You will note that he didn't begin walking with God until verse number 22. And it does 
it does shed light on the fact that the first 65 years of his life he wasn't walking with God. We'll come back to that, okay? But whatever happened when he had a baby, you know, that he began walking with God. Verse 23, and all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Boy, I like that. That'll really preach. And you'll notice that there's an italicis in verse number uh, 24. The word was, it, it was, it's just, and he not. This is good South Philly speech. <laughs> it's like a guy's telling you, man, Enoch was walking with God, man, he not. <laughs> Why? Because he ain't not anymore. He's just not. He was not. And that's exactly how it happened. And God leaves it that way. Don't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. He was walking with God, and he was not. He was, and then he was not. What happened to him? He was translated. What's that mean? He was transported. What's that mean? I have no idea, but it was great. He just walked with God one day, and he was not. We'll talk about this in a minute. If we were able to say that Abel, back in Hebrews 11, showed his faith by his worship, we would say that Enoch showed his faith by his walk. You guys can figure that out. Abel's faith stopped at his sacrifice. You remember he sacrificed. Enoch's faith picked up with sacrifice and beyond that he walked with God. It would have necessitated that he was sacrificing and pleasing God also, but he went beyond the worship. It was a daily walking with the Lord God. He communed with God continually. Notice the, in verse number 22, he, he walked with God for 300 years after begetting Methuselah. Now that's faithful consistency. Most of us really struggle hard to have our devotions continually three days in a row. All right, this guy walked with God 300 years. That's pretty good. You remember from Hebrews chapter 11 passage that Enoch was translated uh, and had the testimony while he was living that he pleased God. Here in our passage in Genesis in 22 and 24 is the action of faith that pleased God. Notice it, please, again, look at that, verse number 24 especially, verse 22 the beginning, and Enoch walked with God, verse number 24, and Enoch walked with God and was not. Here is the action to what he did. This is why he pleased God in Hebrews 11. He walked with him. That's easy to say, isn't it? It's what pleased God. This is both a simple and also a very profound statement that demands our investigation. What does it mean? What does this Hebrew mean word, what word mean that he walked with God? What does it mean to us who want to follow Enoch walking? How many of you say amen really big, you want to walk with God? Amen. I mean, that's a desire of your heart. Well, before you say amen, too late. You better find out what that means. Because Enoch was different, and that's why his painting's in the hallway. And walking with God, he understood what it means. We're all great with lip service, but what does it really mean to walk with God? Do not be distracted as, as this morning we go on a word study. We threw it up on PowerPoint to help you get it easier. You're welcome to change, uh, turn to all these passages. We want to keep rolling. We want to see what it means to walk with God. We must understand what the Bible uh, means when it says many times in the scriptures, throughout the Old Testament into the New, someone walked with God. What's it mean? This same word walked that is used of Enoch is used in our King James Version many times but translated different ways. Sometimes it, it is translated walks, other places in English is translated with or go or went or come or even the word waxed. That is the nature of translation, to choose the best word it, uh, from, that means the same as the original word and fit it into the context of the passage. So let's see what the Old Testament reveals about walking with God. We know that this walking please God. And I want to please God, and you want to please God. So how do we walk with God? Well, first of all, walking with God means intimacy. You know what it means to be intimate with a husband or a wife. That is not what I'm talking about here this morning. The Bible says when it first uses this, the idea that someone walked with God, it was in Genesis 3 and verse number 8. It was used of Adam and Eve. The Bible says that they walked with the voice of God in the cool of the day. Here was the time when there was no sin. Adam and Eve walked they talked, they enjoyed God's presence directly with great joy. They talked to him about things that were intimate or things that were personal to him, to them. I don't think God just came and it was impersonal. It shows by every uh, idea of looking at the passage that it was an intimate thing. They spent time daily with the Lord at a set time. They met him either early in the day uh, or late in the evening, but it was in the cool of the day. I want to tell you, folks, something that is well beyond the fall of Adam and Eve. 
And that is the fact that Jesus Christ has taken our sins away and that we can walk intimately with God every day. Amen. Now, you got to understand that because we look back at that and we say, oh, it's been so great to walk with God. I heard preachers preach that. Walk with the voice of God in the cool of day. It'd be great and good. And the Christians look at that and say, that'd be great. Well, why don't you do it? In some ways, because of what Jesus has done to us, we have the opportunity to be closer to God than Adam and Eve was. Now, you can go back and look at that theologically, but you can draw closer to God in your daily walk than Adam and Eve who walked with God in the cool of the day. As we come back and we think of Enoch walking this way, his walking with God shows faith of becoming intimate with God. This is by faith, believing his voice in his word, folks. Believing that he hears you when you pray and believing that he is talking to you by the Bible. It is not just a generic typing of words that you hold on your lap. It is God's voice talking to you as real as Adam and Eve walking with God, his voice in the cool of the day. This is the voice of God. It is no less the voice of God than if this, this roof would open up and God Almighty would say things directly to you. He has said things directly to you and it's bound in leather on your lap. It is the voice of God. Fear it. It is really God's voice. Wow. Walking with God, as Enoch learned, was also meant something else. It meant holiness and obedience. The scripture talks about in Genesis 6, 9 that Noah was a man who walked with God, that he was just and perfect and walked with God. Obedience. The same idea of obedience and walking with God is used of Abraham in Genesis 17, 1. Listen to the word of God. And when Abraham was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. In these verses, God is pointing out something other than intimacy. He's pointing out that as Christians, when we walk with God, it means that we need to walk obediently. For who can walk together unless they be what? Agreed. Walking with God is also shown in obedience of Solomon. In 1 Kings 9 and verse number 4, the Bible says, And if thou wilt walk before me, as David thy father walked, in integrity of heart and in uprightness, to do according to all that I've commanded thee, and will keep my statutes and my judgment. You'll notice in the passage here, in the top passage, that it deals with obedience. He said to Solomon, God says, If thou wilt walk before me, as what? David walked in integrity of heart and uprightness. Listen, Christian, you want to walk with God and be a believer that walks with God, you've got to deal with this matter of obedience. You've got to deal with the matter of bringing your life into conformity to the verses and the commands of the Bible. You know, I meet a lot of Christians that have this idea, this scheme, and this, this kind of uh, Pollyanna kind of view that they are walking with God, and yet they are directly disobeying the Bible. It's not like that. God wrote this book. It's just as if I would write down some directions to my staff and put them before my staff to do they would ignore that, rebelliously not do that. And then when the next time we got together, do you think it would be all a hunky-dory thing? But yet, somehow, we make up this other standard, this idea of walking with God that is divorced from the idea of obeying Him. And that's an impossibility. Obedi obedience is used as a command of obedience to God's law in Deuteronomy 5.33. You shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you. Listen, believer, you are not walking with God if you're willingly disobeying him in areas of your life. Let me say that again and wake up every one of you. You are not obeying God if you're walking in willful disobedience in areas of your life. Do not fool yourself. You're not having some wonderful relationship with the Lord if you're blatantly disobeying something he said. He said it, not the preacher. He said it, not the deacon. He said it, it's verses, it's right there. He really, I think he kind of meant it. And somehow we have drawn the idea, a picture of a different God that we pray to and we walk with. And yet on this area, in this area of life, we've compartmentalized that I can disobey him and it's still okay. Something's wrong with that as a believer. You cannot be walking with God if you're not holy and obedient to him. Disobedience separates our walk from God. Obedience to him is necessary for fellowship. Now listen to this. This is very important. Of course we daily disobey him. But confession and continual submitted obedience is the key to continually walking with him. You know, it's just silly for us to think that old Enoch never sinned and did wrong. 
That's not, he walked for 300 years with God. That doesn't mean he never disobeyed him. It means that instantly he realized his wrong and conformed to obedience in confession. This transparent struggle is a struggle of every Christian here. The struggle of failure and continual confession and restoration and transparency is walking in 1 John 1 in the light of the Lord. 1 John 1 is talking about his command to walk in the light as he is in the light. And the end of the passage is the verse that we know so much about confession. So how can it be telling someone to walk in the light who, at the end of the chapter, you know that you're going to do wrong? Because God understands our struggles. And walking in the light and walking with, like Enoch with the Lord is struggling, turning our will over in surrender to him and obeying him. And this struggle is going to go on every day of your life. But the guy who walks with God submits when he realizes that he's done wrong. And he struggles to live holy. And that is his goal. And there is not willful disobedience allowed on a continual basis in his life. What a man Enoch was that he walked with God for 300 years. He obviously wasn't perfect, but he never lived in a state of willful disobedience toward God. In fact, Jude chapter four, or Jude chapter one, obviously there's one chapter in Jude, verse 14 and 15 tells us that Enoch preached against sin and sinners. He was a preacher too. Can I ask you about this part of your walk with God? As I look across this congregation, you've come to be arrested by God this morning. May I just ask you concerning this obedience issue? Is there any sin that is worth more than you knowing that you're pleasing God here this morning? Then forsake the disobedience. Right now, confess it and walk with him again. Burn all the bridges back to disobedience. But there's something else it means in Enoch's life to walk with God. It means a daily, constant state of living. It's a continual thing. Don't be a carousel Christian. You know, I, I have seen in times, and perhaps maybe I have been at times, a carousel. You know how the carousel goes up, the horse goes up, the horse goes down. The horse goes up, the horse goes down. There's some believers that live for a period of time, and they're right with God, and then the horse goes down. Okay, And then for a period of time, they're not right with God. They're running away from God. And then all of a sudden, they come and get right. And then the horse goes up again. You know, that's not God's idea for walking a Christian life. Right. Enoch walked with God. That is a continual thing that he did, a constant state. The word translated uh, walking in the Bible is also translated for the idea of a river flowing or going through a valley. Rivers don't stop unless there's a drought. It's the idea of a continual flowing People like Hannah in the Bible, were, it was said that they go childless. They flow or go childless. Enoch walked with God 300 years, a state of being. This is what God intends for every born-again Christian in this room. Our standing in Christ gives us every reason in the world for unbroken, constant flowing with God, not up and down carousel Christianity. Going with God, flowing with God, every day leaning upon Him, hearing His Word, talking with Him, trusting Him, like being carried in the current of a stream, flowing with our God daily, unbroken flowing. Flowing and growing with God. There's something else that it means to walk with God. It means full surrender to God. King David found this out when God was talking to David in 1 Kings 8, 23 talking about him, who keepest covenant and mercy with thy servants that walk before thee with all their heart. Notice, please, and focus on the verse. With thy servants that walk before thee with all their heart. There is a wholeheartedness necessary for you to walk with God. Nobody accidentally walked with God. Nobody tripped into walking with God. There is a surrender value here. I'm sure that there are times when Enoch and God did not see eye to eye, yet in every case Enoch surrendered his will and his heart. David reveals in this First Kings passage that the ones who walk before God do it with all their heart. That is surrender. Notice the last part, with all their heart. Notice the word all. God's word is never a fluff. Every bit of them, outside and inside, surrender. God is their priority. God has full control of their heart. It also speaks of full effort, all their heart. They do all they can to walk with God. Let me ask you a question. Listen, believer, are you doing all that you can in your Christian life to walk with God? Full surrender, that that is your passion, and that is your priority, and that is your goal, that I walk with him like Enoch, that I commune daily with my God, that I am flowing, flowing through this journey, the last song they sang, through this journey of life, I am flowing with God, walking with God. 
it is totally possible for a Christian to live a great portion of their life not flowing with God. Own choices, own goals, own self. Enoch learned that he could hold back nothing, even his heart. So often in my life, I find that there is a dichotomy of the way that I am outwardly and the way that I am inwardly concerning surrender. Listen to me, God only understands one form of surrender. He, he, to, you, to you, you're clear, you're transparent. There's no outside and inside. There is just surrender. And partial surrender is not surrender, and outward surrender is not surrender. He wants all your heart to walk with him. Enoch, God had Enoch's entire heart. Dear child of God, does God have your whole heart today? Are you somehow a partially or a three-quarter surrender Christian? Are you like the half and half that I pour in my coffee? You're just partially. You're a half and half Christian. Maybe you're a coffee mate Christian. You're just powdered stuff. You don't have to live that way. In fact, listen, believer, in many ways, that half and half kind of li living outwardly versus inwardly is torturous to your life. It's torturous to your soul. The most unhappy Christians that I know of are, are Christians that serve God halfway, that have given and surrendered halfway, even though it may satisfy the preacher and everybody else around them. They know there's a reservation well in their heart that they will not give up. They know that there is a, there's decision points and there's lifestyle points. There's, there is attitudes of the heart that they will not give. Walking with God, Enoch walking, is full surrender. It is walking before God with all your heart. There's something else that walking with God means. It means trusting God. The Hebrew term walk is used by Abraham to Eliezer. How many of you have little girls? Raise your hand. How many of you have, okay, let me, let me preface that again. Start again. How many of you have boys, little boys, that are not yet married? Oh, that Brandon and Scott Johnston's parents could be here. <laughs> Abraham had a boy. His name was Isaac. He was the heir to populate this great nation. God told him it was going to happen. God gave his word, belief. Abraham probably doesn't have a wife. That's a bummer. It's only one virgin birth, right? He needs a wife to have this great nation. And so he sends, Abraham sends this, uh, this uh, servant of his, Eliezer, and to go get a bride for Isaac. And, and he makes a great statement. Eliezer is talking about what Abraham had told him in Genesis 24, 40. And he said, unto me, Eliezer says, the Lord before whom I, Abraham, walk, there's our word, now let's look at this, will send his angel with thee and prosper thy way. Here is extremely either arrogance or standing on God's word. He sends out Eliezer. He says, listen, Eliezer, God will prosper your way and get a wife for my son. No, he didn't just say that because Abraham was prideful and arrogant and mean. He based that on something God had told him, that Isaac was going to be, have this great nation come for me. And so he could say with confidence that God was going to do it. Now, this is practical living on a daily basis. This trusting, he, Abraham trusted, he had full confidence because he walked with God that God would directly provide the bride for Isaac. God had told Abraham, and, God, and Abraham, he, went, he sent out his servant based on something God has said, action from belief. Walking with God means you trust him in the daily struggles and the needs and the decisions of your life, folks. Resting on his promises that he has said some verse and you have claimed it, that you know some principle, you know some character trait revealed in God's word about God, and so you live by it. You make decisions on it that he will supply your needs. You make decisions on the steps of a good man or ordered by the Lord. You make decisions based on scripture. That is action of trusting God. That is faith. When we walk with God, we must walk this way. When we walk closely with God, we do not stress and have sinful anxiety. Now look at me up here a minute. There is anxiety that comes from hormones and this wrong and that wrong and medication wrong and all the cones are wrong. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the stress and anxiety that comes from lack of trust in God. Listen, when we walk with God and trusting him, we do not stress that sinful way. We do not 
mull over in our mind worries about what will happen in this area or that area. Listen to me, I am confronting you the, about the source of your anxiety or worry. You are not trusting God. Now that's a pretty sin as Christians. We have pretty sins and bad sins. You know, it's okay to hold an invitation, have people come forward for, you know, anxiety and stress and things like that, because that's not so bad. You open it up for adultery and there's nobody come forward. You know, I'll deal with this in my seat, brother. Trust me. Okay? Now listen, this is a pretty sin, but nonetheless, it's, 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 you can't walk with God not trusting. I'm walking with God, I'm trusting you all the way. Man, I don't know what I'm going to do about that. Oh, God, I'm going to my ulcer. Oh. Whatever it is in the practical, even a bride for Isaac, we must trust God. The walking with God found here with Enoch that pleased God speaks of a trust in God that Enoch maintained all of his life. A confidence in the Lord who promised us so much, a faith trust. And we Christians have got to stop talking about faith and start doing faith. We've got to start walking faith that we know that God is by our side. We know that God will answer, that God will be true to his word and banking on it. Christians, do not, do you walk with God this way or does each new opportunity in your life appear to you as the last straw? Now, well, this is the last straw. I really don't know what that means. I wish somebody would, some farmer would come and say, bring me the last straw because I've never seen it. <laughs> does every opportunity in your life, is that the edge of the cliff for you? This is going to do to me. This is going to, call the doctor, send meds. Call the doctor. I call, do this, do this. And again, I'm talking about sinful anxiety that comes from not trusting God. Wow. Well, your truster is broken. That's what's wrong with you. You're not walking along with the all-powerful, all-caring God. You're just not doing it. He's there and he's your savior if you've been saved, but you're just not walking with him in the trust that Enoch did. Walking with God also means God's presence and rest. And it is used by God to Moses when fleeing Egypt. He says in Exodus 33, 14, and he said, my presence shall go. That is the word walk in our King James Version. And I will give thee rest. My presence shall walk with thee. Just like Adam and Eve. Just like Enoch. And what does it bring? You look up here. Yell it out the last word on that verse. What is it? Rest. When we truly are walking with God in trust, and God's presence, then God's presence will bring us rest. When I think of Enoch, I think of a man who enjoyed fellowship with God all of the time. Maybe he had some woods or some meadow that he prayed in, or maybe a little part of his house that he had set aside as a prayer closet. Maybe he spent long times of prayer just meditating on what God was and what he had said to that point in history. Whatever the case, walking with God means walking with God. There's two people involved with that, with there are two parties present, you and God. Listen to me, Enoch, in fact, in fact, I believe he was much more, because he was walking by faith, not sight, much more like you and I than we ever could imagine. I don't believe he had some euphoric experience out in the wilderness until he was raptured. All right, he was walking by faith with God. He did not feel or experience God's presence. It was nonetheless there. It was by faith, something unseen. Faith is having evidence. Remember in our verse number 1, 2, and 3 of chapter 11? Faith in the unseen. Do you have the character and the courage to say God is walking with me though I feel nothing? Because he said he was. You need to understand, Christian, from everything written in the word that God wants to walk with you every day. Just like Exodus 33, this walking with God ensures his presence and rest for your troubled soul. There is not a person here that does not want God's rest, but that comes at the price of walking and all the definitions that I've already given you in this sermon that comes at a price. Rest only comes by God's presence. God's presence only comes by this trustful communion and walk with him and the constant state of listening to his voice in his Bible with your eyeballs and reading and studying and praying to him and knowing that he hears what you're saying. There are many other examples of this walking in the Old Testament and definition that I could give you. I'll leave the, the Bible study there, and I want to go to the punch of the message, and we're done. I focused on the action of walking with God, but I want to end with the punch to so turn back to Hebrews 11, verse 5 and 6. The Bible says here in Hebrews 11, verse 5 and 6, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated or transported him 
For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. We saw why he brought God pleasure. He walked with him. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You remember that I said that Enoch's story teaches us that those that walk with God by faith will receive full payment, the reward. By faith, Enoch was translated. He was transported. I don't know what that looked like. But God had pleasure in that faith, and Enoch walked with him every day. The same, maybe he walked down the same trail talking with God. Maybe he reviewed the same scrolls that maybe he could get his hands on of what God had said. Maybe he had listened to the, the men, great elders and men of God before him. But he meditated and he, and he spent time communing with God. And then one day God sucked him up to glory. I don't, it, it's very obvious that Enoch didn't know it was going to happen. The way the Old Testament lays it out is wonderful. And Enoch walked with God and was not. This is the great reward of walking with God. What is the reward of walking with God? It is walking with God. Here is a very, every step of walking with God, intimacy and holiness and obedience and daily constant walking, full surrender, trusting God, staying in his presence and rest. Every, every step of walking with God is rewarded greatly and equally. And I don't just mean heaven someday. This picture of what happened to Enoch is a very visual miracle of what God, of how God is promising us that he will reward us for walking with him. Enoch's example here is the ultimate reward to prove to you uh, something this morning from verse number six that those, the end of the verse, those that walk with God will receive the reward. They will receive the reward of seeking after the Lord God. Now follow along. There is a payoff that we should expect when we walk with God uh, like Enoch. There is a reward that is the motivation and the payoff for our faith. We too will walk side with side by side with God when we walk with him by faith every day. And if somehow spiritually we could peel away the, 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 the blinders of spiritual life to those who daily are walking with God, God is literally and spiritually with them in their lives. There is a closeness and a nearness to God that is promised to those that will commune and walk with him. That is not promised to the Christian who will disobey and not trust him, etc., etc. Those that draw near to the Lord, God draws near unto them. And I'm talking about a power to use you and a power to minister to you in the word and a closeness of blessing towards your life, whether that means good or bad. The, the action of walking with God produces in our lives the fact that we know that God is near us Really, what a confidence it has to know that if I will by faith trust God in his word and will walk with him, that if somehow the faith blinder can be pulled back, there is God with me. Now that's powerful when you go to witness to that person. And that's powerful when you go to your ministry. And that's powerful when you settle on the house. And that's powerful when you go to buy a car or when you move your career or you decide to have the next child. That you have the confidence, the end of verse number six, that he will reward those who diligently seek him. And that reward is played out by Enoch that God sucked him up. One day Enoch was walking along, communing with God by faith. And God said to Enoch, in probably a very literal voice at that point, Enoch, you're closer to my house than you are to yours. How about just coming home? Amen. And he did. Amen. And Enoch's physical representation of that Old Testament rapture, of him being in the presence of God, is the promise to us that if we will walk with God, verse number six, God will reward us diligently with being there in our life. 
When you commit your way to him, he works out the circumstances. He is powerfully beside you. He is the protector and the decision maker and the guider. And he's got your hand because you have come and grabbed his. Amen. Christian that is committed to walk with God. To close the message today to those of you who have not come over the bridge of Jesus Christ, you have no promises that I've given you. You must first come to Jesus. You can't walk with God without Jesus first. Today, call on Jesus Christ. Believers, 65 years he walked without God. And one day, maybe it's because he's going to have a baby. That'll shake you, I know. One day, when he was 65 years old, he says, I'm going to live my life differently. And for the next 300 years of his life, he walked with God. And God rewarded that. Now, there are Christians here today that you have not been walking this way. All those things that we saw about Enoch and about walking with God, you are just not walking that way. Will you be honest when you make today the 65th year of your Enoch? And will you begin walking the way the Bible talks about walking with God? Would you stand up, please, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, and we're done.